Hi, my name is Marilo Mello, and Dr. Horel asked me to teach you a theology of genetic engineering in five minutes. The first thing to remember in anthropology is the pervasiveness of the fall. Everything we observe in science is post-fall, including what we know about our DNA. And this text has an important aspect for us today. It expressed that enmity was not only between man and serpent, but between mankind and all livestock, all beasts of the field were cursed by God. And likely, this includes viruses. Retroviruses, like the HIV or in coronaviruses, contain RNA as their genetic material. These viruses cannot replicate by themselves. They need our enzyme reverse transcriptase in our cellular machinery to replicate. As they invade our cells, their viral DNA gets integrated in our genome. When this happens in a pregnant animal or a pregnant woman, this DNA gets in all embryonary cells and gets passed down to future generations. This is so important that although only 3% of our genome codifies proteins, 8% of it is derived from retroviruses who got incorporated in our DNA over generations. Second, all theology is done in the context. We have 2,000 years of theology to form our Christology, but less than 100 to discuss what can be changed in humans so that we do not lose our humanity, since we have organ transplants. This definition of the essence of what is to be a human is a key component of our answers in genetic engineering. This is not sci-fi anymore. Several companies are doing clinical trials treating patients like Brian Mado, who received a gene that we all carry to synthesize a protein that we have, but that he lacked. The most promising technology for this is CRISPR-Cas9. It's interesting that this is also the result of the fall, as bacteria learned how to fight back infections from phages, type of virus that infects bacteria. They learned how to detect RNA and DNA from phages and cut it to pieces. You use the system to detect areas in our genome with some characteristics. We make a cut and paste a specific sequence, which is in the loop in this diagram. We can insert easily these sequences in a cell. And we must learn what is good. This is a quite common, efficient technique in vitro when you do research in a lab, but it is, has great promise to treat simple genetic diseases, like sickle cell anemia, where only one mutation causes a disease. It may also be used in certain types of cancers, which are related to specific mutations that affect only cancer cells. It is much more complex to deal with diseases like Alzheimer or diabetes, where multiple genes are in play. And it has specific challenges, like making changes only in certain cells that produce that protein. Also, to make sure that it does not cause changes in other areas of our genome, Remember that some of them may go silent for a while, as they are not codifying proteins, or they are codifying proteins that we don't know of. Also, how to treat diseases like beta thalassemia, who are caused by hundreds of mutations in different areas of the gene, each one requiring its own targeted treatment. Since some mutations are more common in certain people groups, how do we assure that minorities with poorer populations will also have access to treatment, not only those with mutations that white rich Americans and Europeans have. Our eschatology calls out for all people to experience the blessings of being the new humanity with Christ. We cannot be purely pragmatists. Once you prove safety, efficacy and access, how can we think about this issue? I'm suggesting for you this framework. First, is it somatic, affecting all the cells in a grown body, or embryonary, affecting all cells of the body, as well as future generations? Then, is it curative, treating a disease, or just a matter of preferences? If it is somatic and curative, like all medicine, we would think about this as an organ transplant. If it's somatic and based on preferences, like being stronger, faster, or even having glowing eyes, this whole an enhancement, we think about that as a cosmetic plastic surgery. If it's curative and embryonary, it has the potential to cure not only one person, but their children, future generations. However, if there are terrible side effects, 
they will also hunt down all future generations, so the safety level required here is a completely different ballgame. Finally, if it's embryonary and based on preferences, we are with designer babies, creating a new and improved race, which is abominable. Another layer is when you use this on the environment. It's changing generations, not individuals, of plants, animals, different crops or breeds. And the question is, do we understand the ecology well enough to make these changes? Well, I hope this helped, and our time's up. Thank you.